For several weeks, we have been studying the book of Colossians, and we come today to chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to focus this morning on the first four verses. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. As you see from your notes, you can download them if you're on our website or on YouTube. You can find that the title today is Keep Your Focus. You, if you are a historian of the Masters Golf Tournament, you probably know the story of the 1961 Masters. Uh, Arnold Palmer was talking about it uh, in 2016 in an interview with Jim Nance. It may have been his last television interview before he died. Gary Player was in the clubhouse. He had finished his round. Palmer is still on the course. Palmer is on the 18th hole. He is one shot ahead. All he needs is a par, and he's going to win the tournament. It would have been his third green jacket in four years. He would have been the first back-to-back -back winner to that point at the National. He had a fairly decent drive on the 18th, and he started down the fairway when he says, I subconsciously went against one of my father's famous rules, never count on a win until it's done. But he's on the 18th fairway walking to, to where his ball had landed, and he spotted an old friend, a golf club manufacturer named George Lowe, who waved him over to congratulate him. And Palmer said, I knew better. I knew I shouldn't have done it. But I walked over to where he was, we shook hands, and George said, congratulations, and I said, thank you, and I knew immediately I was in trouble. I knew I had lost my focus. And he had. His next shot went into the bunker. He ended up having a double bogey on that hole and lost the tournament to a guy in the clubhouse. And he said, that was the one time I did something I should have never done. I accepted victory without having victory. It taught me a lesson. I never did it after that. I can tell you that. The next year he won again. <laughs> so he learned a lesson. But what an illustration of the importance of focus. One of the keys to success in any endeavor is keeping your focus. Paul did not famously say, I dabble in two dozen things. Paul famously said, this one thing I do. If you're going to be successful in anything you put your mind to, the key is keeping your focus. I, I don't remember if Brian was playing in this game or if by this point he was coaching but I was at one of his ball games, and one of their good players that you counted on, you know, he's going to do a good job, just had a terrible game. I mean, getting called for ridiculous penalties, dropping passes, just a horrible game. And after the game at some point, you know, I, I was talking to Brian about it, and I said, what happened to so-and-so tonight? And he said... His girlfriend broke up with him right before the game. Now, I have decided if I'm ever going to be a high school athletics coach, I'm going to have a seminar to any girl that wants to date a player of mine, and I'm going to talk to her about how to be the girlfriend of a ball player. And one of the things I'm going to tell them is, don't pick a fight with your boyfriend on game day. You know, Don't break up with him right before a game. High school kids can't keep their focus. Well, a lot of us can't keep our focus either, right? But you know that that's true. You, you wake up and you're just in a great mood and then you spill the milk and cereal's all over the floor. 
and you end up having a bad day at work. Or you have a bad day at work and it ends up causing you to have a bad evening at home. It's hard for us to keep our focus and keep things in the compartment they need to be in. And sometimes you kind of have to slap yourself across the head or pour some cold water on your face or do something to say, get hold of yourself, get your focus back. And a key to keeping your focus is to stay focused on the big picture. Don't allow the little frustrations and distractions of life to keep you from staying focused on the big picture. What's really important here? Another way to say that would be, don't let the distractions shake you loose from your destination. I'm going to say that again. Don't let the distractions shake you loose from your destination. As I was going back over this last night, something was niggling at the back of my mind. Something from Greek mythology that had to do with a girl running a race and apples. And I thought, what? I, I, I got it. And I, I looked it up, and here's what I found. This is a story from Greek mythology. There was a young lady uh, in the town. Her name was Atalanta. She was gorgeous. All the guys in town wanted to marry her. She was also a tomboy. She could outhunt them. She could outrace them. Anything they could do, she could do better. And so many of them proposed marriage to her, and her response always was, if you can beat me in a foot race, I will marry you. Well, one of the elements of the myth is that if they lost, she ended up shooting them with an arrow. So I guess you wanted to make sure you were serious, you know, before you took her on. But she had this little cruel streak, I guess, to her that she'd let the guy get ahead of her and think he was going to win. And then she would put on another burst of speed and catch up to him and end up winning. Well, the myth says that Aphrodite knew a young man in town that she really thought would be the right person for Atalanta's husband. And so she called him to her house and she gave him three perfect golden apples. And she said, if you will distract her with these apples, you can win the race. And he put them in a bag and went to Atalanta's house and he challenged her out loud to a race. And she said, you can't beat me without holding that bag. If you think you can beat me holding that bag, let's go for it. So they set the time for the race. The young man is there, Atalanta's there, and they take off. As she usually did, she let him get ahead. And when he senses her starting to close the gap, he reaches in the bag, takes out one of these beautiful, perfect golden apples, and rolls it on the track. The sun reflects off of it. It catches her attention. She slows down. She stops. She goes to where the apple is, picks it up, looks at it. Young man keeps running. She realizes what has happened. She kicks in that extra burst of speed, starts to catch up to him. He reaches in the bag rolls out the second golden apple. She can't help herself. She runs over to where the apple is. He's pulling away. Now she's desperate, and she kicks in that last final burst of speed. And just about the time she's ready to catch up to him, he pulls out the third apple and rolls it on the track. And once again, she can't resist it, and she goes after that apple. He wins the race. Atalanta keeps her promise and marries him. They move to Georgia, and he names our capital city after her. No, no, no. That's, you'll get that on the way home. Oh, Atalanta. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. That story was kind of a distraction, wasn't it? But, but what, what, a, what a distraction, you know, what, what an illustration that distractions can happen. I mean, I've watched people like in a, in a foot race at a track meet and something happens out in the parking lot 
and half the kids in the race are turning to look at what happened. But typically, the person that want, runs the race, you could set off a bomb beside them, or they're going to keep on going. They do not allow the distractions to keep them from their destination. And that is eternally important when it comes to our spiritual life. And Paul says in this passage, focus on things above. If you're going to keep the right focus as a believer, you've got to stay focused on things above. It's interesting. The, the NIV puts it in a way that kind of grabs your attention. He says, first, in the first verse, set your hearts on things above. That is, make your priority. The King James says, set your affection on things above. Somebody said you could translate that, seek heaven. Set your heart on things above. Seek heaven. And in verse 2, he says, set your mind on things above. The whole, whole focus of our thoughts needs to be the eternal. In other words, not just seek heaven, think heaven. There needs to be about the child of God a focus on heaven. It used to be that churches were on the wrong side of the tracks and Christians didn't have much and they talked a lot about heaven and they sang a lot about heaven and they preached a lot about heaven because they wanted to go. And then churches got fancier and Christians got wealthier and all of a sudden it was like, you know, wait a little longer, Jesus. You know, I'm enjoying it down here. I wonder if maybe part of what's going on in our world right now is the Lord trying to say, would you get hungry for heaven again? You know, would, would you start getting focused on heaven again rather than on the things of this earth? Set your heart on things above. Seek heaven. Set your mind on things above. Think heaven. Now, when you do that as a habitual pattern, of your thoughts, of the attitude of your heart, what will happen is the practical, everyday events of your life will be directed by Christ. When he says, don't seek earthly things, he does not mean don't have a job. He doesn't mean don't be involved in the things of this earth. In fact, history has shown us that the people who are the most focused on heaven are also the people that are the most intensely focused on making a difference on the earth, getting involved, making a difference in people's lives. So make sure that your focus is heaven, your ultimate goal is heaven and eternal values, and as you do that, Christ will direct your activities and you will make a difference in your world. I remember a long time ago hearing somebody say, there's all the difference in the world between making a living and making a life. Making a life is what's important. It's not so much as making a living, it's making a life. What somebody said is what you live for is much more important than what you live on. <laughs> I like that. What you live for, much more important than what you live on. I, I read this quote from James Dobson. He wrote, I have concluded that the accumulation of wealth, even if I could achieve it, is an insufficient reason for living. When I reach the end of my days, a moment or two from now, I must look backwards on something more meaningful than the pursuit of houses and lands and machines and stocks and bonds nor is fame of any lasting benefit. I will consider my earthly existence to have been wasted unless I can recall a loving family, consistent investment in the lives of people, and an earnest attempt to serve the God who made me. That's 
set your focus on Christ. And people who are focused on eternal things have an intensity about their lives that are not easily sidetracked by trivial pursuits. The second practical effect of this focus on things above is that it will bring eternal motives to the most ordinary, mundane, daily, earthly duties and responsibilities. You will do earthly things for eternal reasons. It is possible to have two people do the same activity, one of them for an earthly reason, one of them for an eternal reason. The believer is to do everything they do for an eternal purpose. One of the study resources I'm using uh, for this series is a book that I think my dad gave me. He got it at a yard sale. And, and the comments on this passage, in the margin, the person who originally had the book had written, Lord of Pots and Pans. Uh, Lord of Pots and Pans. That's an intriguing concept when you think about doing all to the glory of God and doing earthly things with an eternal motive. And so, you know, I got out the Google machine and I looked up Lord of Pots and Pans. Sure enough, it comes from a, a little poem called A Kitchen Prayer by Clara Munkris. And this is the first verse of that. Lord of all pots and pans and things, since I've not time to be a saint by doing lovely things, or watching late with thee, or dreaming in the dawn light, or storming heaven's gates, make me a saint by getting meals and washing up the plates. I like that. The Lord of pots and pans. It's Brother Lawrence, the practice of the presence of God, who as a kitchen helper in the monastery said, my sink filled of dirty pots and pans is my altar whereby I worship God. When you set your focus on things above, then the normal, boring, ordinary stuff of life will be done with an eternal motive and an eternal purpose, and it will take on spiritual significance. As you live out 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Because when you focus on things above, as Paul clarifies here in Colossians 3, you will actually be focusing on Christ. Because that's where he is. He is above. And as we focus on things above, our focus is actually on Christ. It's not, he, he is not saying, focus on things above. Isn't it going to be exciting to have walls of jasper and streets of gold? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about focusing on the one who is above, focusing on Christ. Mentioned to you last week, the recurring theme of the book of Colossians is Christ in you. And as we stay focused on him, we learn some things. Paul tells us, first, he is seated at the right hand of God. That's significant, that Christ is seated. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the writer says, after he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Later in the book of Hebrews, the writer says, the priests on this earth were always standing but when Jesus, our high priest, presented his offering, he sat down. Why? Because his job was finished. See, the priests in this earth had to stay standing because there were always people coming to sacrifice for their sins because the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins. So the earthly priest's job was never done. But when Jesus offered himself, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And as our priest, he takes himself as the offering 
to the heavenly father, he is able to sit down. What was the thing he said on the cross? It is finished. It's accomplished. I did what I came to do. He is seated because his job is done. He has provided salvation once for all for our sins. There are only two times in the New Testament that you see Jesus standing. One of them is in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is being martyred for his faith. The Son of Man is like Jesus is standing up to welcome Stephen into heaven. And the second time is in Revelation chapter 5, at the end of things, when Jesus ascends to the throne for all eternity. Otherwise, he is seated because his work is done. Paul goes on to say, you were raised with him. This is what we talked about Easter Sunday, that Jesus' physical resurrection makes possible our spiritual resurrection. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but we have been raised with Christ. But going forward, he says, we died in him. That's kind of, why wouldn't he say we died in him and then we were raised in him? Well, because he's not talking about uh, the death to sin. Here he's talking about Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I. Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the power of the Son of God. What Paul is saying here is we died in him. That is to say, I am now living for Christ. Instead of setting my heart and my mind on what I want, on my calendar, on my agenda, on my priorities, I have died to that, and I am now alive to his calendar, to his priorities, to his schedule, and we've all lived long enough to know that Christ's calendar for you probably looks a little different than your calendar for you. And it's important for us to realize we are to be dead to our own self-interests and alive to God. Then he says, our life is now hidden with Christ. That's an interesting concept. I had to do some digging on that. And, and the practical application of that phrase is when you live in Christ, people are not going to be able to understand you. There will be things about your life that are hidden from them. The source of your strength to get through the tough times of life, the, the, the nature of your joy in the midst of heartache, the cause of your peace in the midst of storm, those things will be hidden from them because you are in Christ. But there will come a time as Paul continues, that we will be revealed in him. There will come a time when people will understand what it means to live a life for Christ. But in the meantime, he says, Christ who is your life. Jesus said, he who has the Son has life. He who doesn't have the Son does not have life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. In another place, Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Christ is your life. Is he? Is he our life? Can we say in him, I live and move and have my being? Can we say without him, I could do nothing? The, the college that we attended had, was on a, a campground where a lot of retired preachers and evangelists and missionaries moved for their retirement. It was not in by any stretch luxurious at all. They were campground cabins. But they would go down there, you know, through the, the winter months. And those old timers in, in the circles that Don and I grew up in, they believed in early morning prayer. 
And what they meant by early morning prayer was five o'clock in the morning, early morning prayer. I don't know what verse in the Bible they drew that from. To me, early morning prayer is 10, 30, 11, you know, but, but early morning prayer was five o'clock. And so the church facility was open every morning at five o'clock for these old saints to come and pray. And they did. And we also grew up in, in the, the area of the church or the realm of the church where people prayed out loud and all at the same time. You might have somebody called to lead in prayer, but there were all people all through the congregation who were praying, some of them louder than the people who were supposed to be leading in prayer. And so, you know, when you're studying for the ministry, and you hear about this five o'clock prayer meeting, there is some kind of peer pressure that says, I need to go to the five o'clock prayer meeting. I did. A couple times. <laughs> There's a famous story of a ministerial student who went to the five o'clock prayer meeting and was still in his place, stretched out on the pew at chapel time at 8.30 when chapel came in. <laughs> but, but at least I managed to stay awake. But I remember, and, and I went, honestly, to listen to the saints pray as much as I did to pray because they were all praying out loud. They were scattered all through that church praying. You talk about holy ground, man. Listening to some of these people who had served God 50, 60 years listening to them pray. And I would just walk the aisles and walk in among the pews and listen to them pray. And I remember somebody saying, God, I can't live a minute without you. And in my young stupidity, I thought, well, how crazy is that? Of course you can live a minute without God. I don't know. <laughs> I about decided he was right. <laughs> Lord, I can't live... Can't live a moment without you. That's what Paul is saying. Keep your focus on the eternal. Keep your focus on Christ. Doesn't mean you're not involved with the activities of this world, but it means that you do the activities of this world with the motivation of bringing glory to God and making a difference in this world for him. It makes all the difference in the world. No matter how aggravating your job is, if you stop before your work day starts and say, God, I give this day to you. Help me to be a witness for you today. Help me to reflect you today. Help me to have your wisdom today. Help me to treat people the way you would treat them today. Help me to listen with patience today. You know, it would make a difference in how you did your day, right? If that focus is, Lord, set my heart on things above, set my mind on things above. Today, let me seek heaven, let me think heaven. I almost brought it, but it, it wouldn't have shown up on the camera and y'all wouldn't have been able to see it from up here. But I have a little placard I found years and years and years ago. It's in my office, and it simply says this. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's right. That's what Paul's saying in this verse. Don't get distracted. No matter how pretty those golden apples are, don't get distracted. Keep your focus on Christ. And it'll make in the difference, all the difference in the world as to how you live your life. Father, that's easy for us to say, but when we're out there in the middle of things, if we're not careful, we get distracted from you. So help us, Father. And there are a lot of things out there, and, and, and many of the distractions that are out there, are, they're not sinful, they're not wicked, they're not bad. They're just things that distract us from you. So help us, Father, to keep our focus on you. 
And while we are actively engaged in the things of this world, while we are making a living, while we are building a family, while we are doing the responsibilities of life, may we do them all with an eternal motivation and an eternal focus. I am doing what I'm doing right this moment for the glory of God. May that just be our burning passion to make a difference to your glory and to keep our focus on you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here today. God bless you.